one thing that struck me watching this again tonight is just how close you are in these very intimate moments. And you know, these moments are already very tense and difficult, and I'm wondering what it was like to actually be there with the camera experiencing these moments, and if you think that changed things for better or worse, and essentially like how that worked. Yeah, I mean, I, I felt really privileged, you know, to be there uh, in, in throughout this film. I've never had such a, a better experience shooting and making a film than this one. And, um, you know, I'm always amazed at the honesty and courage uh, I think people display to, to be so open and, and let us in. And I think some of that comes with, you know, the trust that gets built up with us and the interrupters and then with people like Capricia, you know, that we got to know as well, or little Mikey, folks like that. Um, does it change it? I mean, that's that big question, right, in every documentary. Does it change it? I, I feel like um, on some level it's probably impossible for a camera being there to not have some impact. Um, I'm more often struck by how little being there seems to make a difference. I mean, the, the social forces at work in people's lives in most of the films that I've been involved with are so great and so profound that me being there with a camera uh, doesn't really uh, have any measurable impact on their life. In the moment, um, you know, it, it, it was really interesting in the Capricia moment, there was a point there, you know, when Capricia says to Amina, you know, it's so easy for you to open up, and Amina's saying it's not easy for me to open mm -hmm. up. And we had witnessed how hard it was for Amina to open up over the course of filming her for over a year. And at one point, they, they kind of went back and forth on that, and I just, I did something I don't normally do in those situations. I said, can I, you know, I kind of said, I put the camera, I said, can I say something here? And they kind of both looked at me, because <laughs> they were so into their, and they went, what? And I said, I just want to say that to Capricia, it, it is not easy for me to open up. And Amina didn't want me to say it. She knew where I was going. She kind of cut me off because she she just said no no this isn't about me this is about her you know you know she didn't want to make this about her because she was trying anyway so then i said well there's one other thing i want to say which <laughs> <laughs> so they were like what and i said well capricia if if one of the reasons you're not opening up to amina is because we're here mm -hmm. like if there's things you want to talk to her about but you don't want us here to to film this then we'll walk away we'll leave and you know, and Capricia looked at me and went, no, that's not it. <laughs> and, and which is not to say that that doesn't happen, and, and it does happen all the time, and, and, and you have to be willing, I think, as a filmmaker to walk away from situations and let people have those moments. And I have over the years, and that's happened, and, and there's things that have happened that I didn't ever found out about, you know what I mean, and, or till after the fact. So um, anyway, long rambling answer. But I, I, one other thing, I, I do think that the way in which film being there can impact that's a, that to me is a positive thing, but makes it no less true is that I think the experience of being in a film for people in a film like this can is a therapeutic experience. It was for Eddie. He's talked about that to us since the film was over. It gives people a chance to think about their lives. We're, we're asking them to think about their lives and reflect on their lives, and, and that can be a good thing. And there's that moment in the car with Flamo when they go to get the jerk chicken where he looks out the window and he's saying, I'm, I'm tired of being out here with all the gangbangers and the drug dealers and I, I, I don't want to be, I want to be the one telling the story. I think he, that was going through his mind. If we hadn't been there with the camera, maybe he wouldn't have said that. Maybe he just would have sat there and looked out the window and thought it. But I think he probably felt some compulsion because we were there to articulate it in some way. And to me, that's a good thing. It's, it makes it no less true or honest. It just makes it more uh, outward you know, expression. Has this film shown in that community? Yes. Um, the film played for quite a while in, in, um, in two theaters uh, that are in, one that's very close to where we did a lot of the shooting, another one that's not far away, but, um, you know, and, and through, and, and around the country through community screenings and stuff, we're getting it into communities that are like the ones we were in, mm -hmm. which is great. Probably the, the best, you know, I don't know, endorsement of the film in Chicago in those communities is we've been seriously bootlegged on the south side and the west side. 
<laughs> like for five dollars, you can get the film, and I understand it's a real. I've been trying to get one because I want to see how good it looks, but I understand <laughs> it looks pretty great. So, and it's only five dollars, and um, you know, so there you go. Yeah, we could have. There were so many candidates around that table. You get a, a feel for it uh, in the film, I'm sure. Um, we knew from the start we wanted to follow Mina. That that was someone immediately because she was one of the few women interrupters. Her because of who her father was and just who she is. I mean, she's this force of nature. So we we approached her right away. There were other interrupters that we um, had targeted, other than Kobe and Eddie. Uh, and a, one guy we followed quite a bit, but it became clear that he just didn't, he was not going to be comfortable with us being in the streets with him when he was trying to deal with situations. It just became clear and clear that that was not going to happen. And so we, we moved on from him. Uh, with, with Kobe, he, Tio would tell people at the table on a weekly basis, we were there at the beginning every week for those meetings to get people and meet people and get them acclimated to us. He would, routinely say to them, look, if you guys have mediations, these guys, you know, and you think they can be there, I want you to call them. And Kobe was the guy that did it, I mean, more than any. And he would just call us up and say, hey, I've got a situation in a parking lot, you know, this guy stole shoes and this other guy's angry. And, and he, you know, he just sort of, he was so good at getting us into situations that he emerged and then we met him and we thought this guy's really interesting and he's really effective. And that's how he became a character. And then Eddie, we knew we wanted to follow at least one Latino interrupter. We had our eye on the guy that was actually profiled in the New York Times article more. But he just wasn't comfortable with the camera being around. And when we met Eddie, we just thought, what an interesting guy. He was new to the table. And we just thought his story of a guy that was grappling, you know, very personally with having committed, you know, the ultimate act of violence would just make a great part of this story, you know. Um, and that he was a guy that was trying to think of different ways to reach people, like through art and, and, and other means. Part of my motivation for wanting to do the film was that um, there were two very prominent people from Hoop Dreams who have been murdered in the years since we finished that film. Uh, Arthur Agee's father, Bo, was murdered in 2006, and William's brother, Curtis, was murdered back in 2001. And just seeing the devastating impact that that the violence had on both those families and those young men was not something you know anyone would forget, um, especially someone you've come to know so well. And um, but I think I had come to believe from reading the papers daily and seeing this the the steady stream of articles about this person dying in this neighborhood and that person dying, and I had kind of I think I'd come to believe that um, that the situation was pretty hopeless there. And, and that people felt hopeless, and that may, or that um, if they didn't feel hopeless, or maybe both, they felt numb to the, the steady litany of violence that they were living with. And I think what was great about this experience of doing this film was realizing, number one, um, people are angry in these communities. And to me, that really denoted that they have not given up because they're angry, and they want this to be different. They haven't given up on their communities. And, and they've definitely not numb. And, and even though there wasn't a, I don't think there was a single person we encountered making this film who had not been personally touched by violence. Not a single person. I mean, either a family member or a friend or both, oftentimes more than one or two. It, it was amazing. Yet, you know, when people lose someone, it doesn't matter how many people they've lost. It's devastating. And maybe even more devastating. And so I think all of those things surprised. And then I guess the last thing would be is, is that we didn't go into this film, I think, expecting to come out as inspired <laughs> as we were by the work that, you know, I mean, we've been debating the causes of violence in urban neighborhoods for decades, and there's been, and, and we, we need, there, there needs to be much work done on many realms with this. But what was so amazing was seeing folks who are from these neighborhoods doing this work and ha making an impact person by person. And that, that was a profoundly moving and uh, inspiring experience for us. And, and, um, and, you know, we didn't, I don't think we necessarily expected that to happen. <laughs>